your natural reflex is to pull back or did you turn and embrace the full complexity of the situation and try to build the capacity, your own capacity and that of others to deal with complexity going forward. Business of Architecture, episode 233. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. As a podcast listener, get free instant access to my four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects and design professionals. Get rid of the post-it notes and Excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple, beautiful, and easy-to-customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all that profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. Learn more and get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Have you ever felt like there's too much to get done in one day? And yet, when we look at some of the world's most prolific entrepreneurs, people like Richard Branson and Elon Musk, the way they've been able to build these great companies isn't by doing everything themselves. They've succeeded by succeeding through others. So as I've researched what the world's most successful architecture and design firms do, I've noticed that they have a culture of empowering a group or a team of individuals to each individually do their best work and do it enthusiastically. The best leaders know how to succeed through others, and this is the epitome of leadership. Today's guest is here to talk about being a better leader, how we can achieve results far beyond our own personal abilities by empowering others. Joining us today is Dr. Peter Delisle, Honorary AIA. He's a principal with EduSet, and he helps run the Emerging Leaders Program at AIA Dallas. So without further ado, here's today's show about building a team and leading. Hi, Pete. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thanks, Andy. It's a pleasure to talk with you. So you do speak and talk a lot about and write about leadership and about collaborative companies. As a matter of fact, you contributed to a book recently, Leading Collaborative Architectural Practice. Could you just tell me what leadership means for you? Sure. I'm happy to. This has been an important part of my life um, throughout my career and uh, for a number of different reasons, uh, usually as a result of the experiences that I was having in my life. And so I've always been not just curious, but compelled to try to understand what leadership and leadership effectiveness is all about. And I find an awful lot of people find the concept to be a little elusive or maybe even obscure, or that just about any description actually uh, uh, gives uh, some perspective to what it is. And therefore, I I tried to unlock it. And uh, through both personal experiences and and going back to school uh, at the ripe old age of 40 years old, I tried to, um, to... get a perspective that was useful for me. So a couple of things uh, initially that I'd, I'd mentioned, and that is an awful lot of the conversations about leadership are based upon characteristics. Um, and I, I think that has great merit, and I wouldn't want to sound in any way disrespectful about that. But for me, the problem with uh, just talking about characteristics of, of behavior, if you will, um, uh, paraphrasing, uh, calling it kind of the good person theory, uh, the the idea, of course, is if you're a good person, you'll be a good leader. And, and truthfully, I wouldn't want to argue with that. But uh, going back to school with a, you know, having been scuffed up a little bit, and um, what I realized was that I met an awful lot of really good people that weren't very effective leaders. And sadly, I'd met some fairly despicable people that were pretty influential. And so I had to move away from the idea of a characteristics-based model with great honor and respect. I would never discard it. But I wanted to start to take a look at the behaviors of leaders and what caused them to be effective. And therefore, what I essentially uh, centered my investigation around and or, you know, my uh, my advocacy around are three things. And that is, you know, the ability of a person to influence. And that takes some multiple forms. And as you desire, we can talk about that. And that's actually what fundamental, fundamentally what I think leading is all about. But, but there's other factors that are critical as well. uh, Next of which is that you have to be uh, critically reflective and think about the impact of your behavior on other people. And as a result, constantly in the process of 
trying to understand the circumstances and situations. And then finally, and probably most importantly, uh, leaders have to really make commitments to do things. You know, it's one thing to make promises that are unkept. It's another thing to tell someone that you're going to act upon their behalf, which is a leader behavior. But it's problematic when someone says that they'll do something and fails to do so. And truth be told, that's where the whole equation, I think, starts to, to collapse under the weight of kind of uh, false commitment. So as I, I, I look at it, what it means to me is that these three ideas of the ability to lead and influence others, the ability to be decisive and make decisions and think about the impact of your behavior, and then uh, making an honest commitment to this whole process uh, are kind of an organizing model that I use uh, to try to help people uh, essentially understand that there's a, this is an interactive and dynamic process, and, and it's a constant process as well. It's it's almost as if there's really no end state. It's a it's a it's a a phenomenon of growing and developing over an extended period of time. Um, that being said, I've had the good fortune to work with young architects, in some cases, who haven't finished their AREs. I've had the uh, and have had the experience of working with very very senior architects and fellows of the academy. And it seems to me as though all of us are beset with similar problems that are kind of centered around these three important. Uh, uh, anchors, if you will, in terms of this process of examining what leadership's about. Uh, that that was probably a way too long <laughs> exposition on a simple question, but did, did that help at all in terms of shaping the conversation? Yes, and Peter, tell me, why is it that you feel, what is it that you feel is so important about leadership? You've devoted, obviously, a lot of your career to researching this. What is important about leadership? Well, it, it, for me, it takes two forms. First of all, it's, it's critically important for the success of, of enterprise. Um, so if we think of it purely in a commercial point of view, uh, a, a simple equation is that the best companies are more often than not the people with the best leadership. And I, I'm not trying to oversimplify that, but if you go back and, and take a look at the organizations where people thrive and develop and, and uh and fortify their commitment to the organization, that usually has a direct and immediate impact on their viability as a company. But it's it's almost larger than that for me, and it, because you know there are demands that are outside uh, the responsibilities that we carry working within a firm, uh, or even in this particular case, a profession. And one of the things I admire most about the profession of architecture, and, and you know, truth be told, now I'm not I'm not a trained architect. I'm just kind of an informed, affectionate outsider, or maybe even a wannabe. But the thing about architecture is that the mindset that I've encountered in working with architects is one of uh, a larger perspective or point of view. It's, uh, if you will, like, architects tend to get the whole problem, the gestalt of the problem, if you will. Well, what that causes me to see is that architects are people that are probably most suited, and here I'm an unabashed advocate, but architects are most suited to embracing uh, what has been described to me as reciprocity. Now, that doesn't mean quid pro quo. What it means is that people have rights and responsibilities. And at, one, at some point in time, the leader actually says, you know, other people's rights are my responsibility. And that over the years recently has led to some really important conversations about the role of the architect, as a matter of fact, you know, my my uh, my viewpoint is that architects should be leading uh, our communities and our society because they they see the wholeness of the problem, and they embrace it in a way different than other professions. And I have great admiration for what architects do and are capable of doing. And I just want to encourage them to get involved because that special perspective and that capacity to see just beyond the boundaries of organizations or the self-interest that a person might sometimes to come to is something that I think is very admirable. And when you talk about leadership, you mentioned rights and responsibilities. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, I guess uh, the easiest uh, way I can describe that is the, the big question. Who is, who is responsible for the built environment? Um, and you just pause for a second and think about that. Oftentimes people are, you know, stop for a moment because we're talking about a a sense of, of responsibility and commitment that goes just beyond uh, individual personal practice. And, um, and in this particular case, rights are uh, the, the, the large questions like, well, who, 
Uh, who is responsible for people having a decent place to live? Uh, who's responsible for the environment uh, being protected? Who's responsible for communities operating in a hospitable way so that people have access to, to uh, parks and to recreation, but more importantly to uh, community aspects of schooling and transportation? And so if, if, you, if you can answer the question, who's responsible, then we, then we start the analysis of is that is a decent place to live a right and or uh, just a, a luxury for people. If uh, how about how about health care? Should people have access to health care? How about you know, decent education for our children? And those those become kind of meta values that I think about when I talk about this idea of rights and responsibilities. And what's your answer to that question? Who is responsible for the built environment? Well, you know, the answer that I get invariably from the young architects that I work with is, well, we are, almost without any hesitancy. And I find that's a different reflex than sometimes I get when I work with in other disciplines who don't have that sense of, of otherness, if you will. So that's going back to your previous comment about how you find architects have a particular mindset that lends itself to what you think leadership in the greater community. Is that correct? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Well, tell me how leadership isn't, why leadership is important from an organizational aspect when we're talking about teams and businesses. An awful lot of people view organizations as a purely business enterprise, if you will, which is motivated by profitability. Um, and I've seen that particular mindset be successful. So I, there's no veiled criticism here, but I've also seen organizations solely driven by profitability actually destroying themselves from within because they lost sight of the other factors associated with an organization's success. And so, you know, as I started to examine this, and my, my part of my professional endeavors involved being a human resources executive for, for a couple of companies, and I happened to work for companies that really had this, uh, this sense of understanding and and a sense of, frankly, human compassion as it related to how they created and sustained environments for people to work in. You know, that, that being said, uh, leaders are the persons that, in fact, create these environments. And, you know, as I, I studied this and tried to formalize it, uh, what we're actually dealing with is something that is called technically a socio-technical system. And what that means is that the human factors are just as important in any endeavor as, if you will, the, the technical factors. Now, most people start thinking about uh, IT as technology, but, you know, the, the elegant Greek term techne actually loosely translated, translated means the art. You know, and if anyone, any group of people embrace the whole idea of art in, a, in, an, art, in an environment that tries to articulate useful things for society, it's, it's architects. So the leaders are the people that balance the, relentless pursuit of excellence, if you will, because everyone wants to do the best job they can, with also a sense of commitment to people and to their capabilities and to their resilience and, and, the, and the possibilities that they can do work at, over an extended period of time, as opposed to simply being seen as, if you will, cogs in a machine. Now, I, I don't necessarily localize that argument in it to, to architecture or to even high tech. But if you go back and actually study the whole process of leadership, you'll find that every successful endeavor had a person or persons working together cooperatively to try to create and sustain an environment that is, again, relentless in its pursuit of excellence while sustaining effective relationships with people. Because the real challenge for all leaders is they never have enough time. And so they're always looking for a way to have a balance between those two key factors. What kind of attributes go into a workplace environment that creates this ideal leadership kind of environment that you seem to be speaking about? Well, you know, um, that's a really good question. Uh, first and foremost, I think communication is, is a key. And I don't want to sound cliche when I say that, but uh, the elements of communication in this particular case are the fact that the, the people, the leaders and or the participants in the organization are critically self-reflective about their behavior and the impact uh, of their behavior on other people. And that being said, that there are also some very clear and very robust uh, 
pathways for active communication with an organization. And so we, you know, we find ourselves uh, essentially not destroying the hierarchy, but trying to move away from just this linear view of how people communicate up and down organizations. And as a result, leaders are accessible and, and are constantly uh, seeking information about the organization, the impact of their behavior, and what people in the organization are, are thinking and feeling in terms of their, you know, their active involvement in what's going on. So communication and therefore critical self-reflection are two, I think, key factors. Uh, open lines of communication and feedback up and down and sideways in our organization is, is another key factor. And then I once, uh, once heard an Army general describe what he thought the, the most important factor that contributes to uh, effective organizations on the part of leaders. Uh, and, you know, this is an Army general, so you'd be expecting something in a kind of a, a tactical mindset. But he said, no, actually the most important behavior that leaders should demonstrate is human compassion. And I found that to be a fascinating comment and has helped guide my thoughts and investigations since. Now, the sad thing about that is oftentimes when you hear these comments, people will say, well, that's all the soft stuff. You know, that's the touchy-feely stuff, which, you know, I've, over time I've just become weary of that kind of uh, inability to deal with the complexity of how the world operates. Sometimes I push back well, with my friends and I'll say, you know, you say it's soft, but it's so hard for you to do it. And that leads us to some pretty interesting conversations about can you learn how to become influential? Can you enhance your communication capacity? Can you build reliable systems of feedback in an organization? And, you know, sometimes I try to sneak up on my architect friends by saying, look, it's a design problem. And once we get to the point where we're thinking about uh, this, this kind of a ideal environment, if you will, that's hospitable to people, what you really see ultimately is a design problem. Okay. And so I'm, you kind of gave me my questions for me there, Peter. Can, can you learn? Can you learn to be influential? And if so, how? Well, I, <laughs> I, I certainly hope so. Otherwise, I've, I've, I've been a voice crying in the wilderness now for a while. Um, first and foremost, my, my personal experience uh, has, has caused me to learn a tremendous amount of things. Um, because of a willingness and an openness to, to change. Uh, and also a recognition of the fact that I've made a whole bunch of mistakes in my life. And fortunately I was able to learn from most of them. But in this particular case, it's an attitude and inclination on the part of an individual to grow and discover their own personal effectiveness. And then that, that elaborates outward to their professional effectiveness. So when I, when I look at um, uh, people that are coming up in the profession, it becomes apparent and many times that their, some of their behaviors are telltales uh, for their capacity to learn. And then the challenge becomes putting information in their pathway when they have demonstrated this inclination and, uh, and strong interest in learning. And then it becomes uh, a collaborative effort going forward. Now, I'm not sure that that, that makes a lot of sense, but let me, let me give you a, a simple guideline if, if I can. Um, if, you, if you imagine kind of a continuum where one pole on the, on the uh, continuum is, is self-interest and the other pole on the continuum is self-sacrifice, both of those are inherently good things. Uh, they're polarities, though. Uh, and my argument is, you know, you, you must have a healthy sense of self-interest because that means you're taking care of yourself and your health and your growth and your family and the other responsibilities that you have. And so that that's a critical component to a person's viability going forward. The other extreme is self-sacrifice, and that is where you center your behaviors on serving, uh, leading other people by serving them and assisting them in their personal growth and development as well. And so at either extreme, you can have you know a, a problem because too much self-sacrifice means that sometimes you get lost in the lives of other people and have lost sight of yourself. Too much self-interest uh, creates some interesting problems as well because that means that a person often acts to their own benefit and in some cases might even act uh, in a harmful way to other people because they feel they have to win and are unwilling to give other people uh, the opportunity to, 
participate and contri- contribute as well. So my argument um, in terms of that the person who can actually learn to lean is a person that understands the importance of self-interest, uh, but also is inclined specifically toward helping people be successful going forward. So if you visualize kind of a, a midpoint to that continuum I've been describing, uh, the leader is the person, whether they have any kind of formal responsibility or not, who is very much inclined toward self-sacrifice, to self-sacrifice, or maybe a better way of describing it might be uh, a sense of altruism, where they're willing to give of themselves to other people without any expectation or reward. And when that, when a, a young leader starts to demonstrate those behaviors, then the the knowledge that you uh, the environment that you create and the knowledge that you place in their pathway uh, is a way of helping resolve perhaps some of the questions they have, unlock some of the inclinations they have, and then fortify, fortify their behaviors going forward, which looping back to that idea of critical self-reflection then becomes almost like a flywheel. They just take on more responsibility. They act uh, benefiting other people. Therefore, they're given more responsibility. And in many cases, these are the the young architects who are professionally competent, but also are seen by their peers and by their bosses and subordinates as someone they want to work with, someone they want to follow. And uh, once again, I, I hope I didn't drift too far away on that topic for you, but I can give you some specific examples, if you like, of things that you can actually teach people. So what I'm hearing you saying is that a good leader, someone who wants to increase their influence is a person who has a healthy dose of self-sacrifice over uh, self-interest. Is that correct? Well, you know, one, once, yes, that is correct. Um, and in this particular case, the self-sacrifice usually is a result of them knowing that they're, they're, they're a, a conscious and competent person. They can, they can do their work effectively, which means that they're willing to spend some of their most precious resource time in helping other people. And that, frankly, is, is a, an inspirational thing for many people. And it doesn't have to be in a formal position. It could be just in studio, kind of one, you know, one board to the other, uh, people working together and just understanding each other's needs and just helping them in a very, uh, very straightforward and disarming kind of a way. But that also begs the point, and that is, what happens when a person is purely self-interest if you're self-interested in as a position of, of responsibility for other people. And that can fairly quickly uh, destroy the efficacy of an organization, especially if people that are assigned uh, to the individual who's ostensibly guiding the group see that basically that person is purely interested in their own success going forward and, and or use or manipulate people. So that's a, it's a really strong telltale and when you get into conversations about, uh, you know, who would you like to work for, more often than not, it's the person that's genuinely interested in helping other people. And you said you had some examples. I'd love to get one or two specific examples of how we can teach this to people, as you said. Sure. Uh, you know, communication 101 <laughs> is, a, is a starting off point. And when we start, but, but oftentimes people, communication is a term that people overuse and, and, uh, and allow it to kind of wash over so many specific behaviors. So, uh, you, there, so there are two things that I, I offer. The first is that it's an, it shouldn't be an academic exercise. So this is not something you should read about. This is something you should do, which leads me to the tactic that we employ in terms of developing um, is this communications capacity, and that is experiential learning. So more often than not, when we put people in situations where they have to demonstrate uh, behaviors and then without being judgmental, ask them to critically reflect on what they learned in the process of a communications exercise and then, and then present ideas about how uh, there might be a negative variance between certain approaches and a more effective approach then what happens is that the adult, the adult learner will then embrace those new behaviors because they can visualize, first of all, what they did, where it might be in contrast to what they would prefer to do or understand based upon other strategies that they should be doing, and then we encourage them to, to get on to new behaviors. So a real practical example will be you got somebody who is uh, working with you in studio, 
and they're a good person, uh, but they're just really annoying. You know, they talk too loud or whatever else. I mean, these are just things that you just wish they'd stop. Um, but, you know, but they're, they're a good person and they do good work. It's just they're not aware of the fact that, uh, that their behavior is, is annoying. And so how do you approach somebody and talk with them about the fact that if they could throttle their voice down a little bit, everybody would be a little happier working with them. Um, and so then you start thinking about, well, what are the risks associated with giving someone feedback about a part of their behavior that then we routinely, ret- excuse me, that we refer to using kind of a, uh, you know, a, a, a communications term. Uh, we, we talk with them about how do you give someone feedback about their blind self or the part of them that everybody else can see, but they can't see. And how do you, how do you approach that type of thing? Uh, if you're, if you're a, a supervisor, you, you really have to approach it. But if you're a peer, that's a different circumstance or worse yet, how do you approach a boss that's demonstrating unwanted behavior um, and do so in such a respectful way that they listen carefully and then are encouraged to make change. So that, that, that'd be a very simple and, and discreet scenario that might be played out. Um, and, and that would be one of the tactics. Another one that's actually my favorite is uh, working with um, people's understanding of uh, how folks approach problem solving from a cognitive point of view. And I'm, I'm not a psychologist, so uh, yeah, I kind of run everything through the, the, the lens of does this really work and does it make sense? But we have a, a wonderful conversation about how people think about problems, uh, metacognition, if you will, not how they solve problems, because as architects, People are trained to be problem solvers, but we get up, uh, get upstream of that a little bit and start talking about, have you ever thought about how your brain operates in terms of how you want to solve a problem? And so um, using a, an inventory, which is another experiential learning technique, which works very effectively, and then talking about archety- archetypes of problem solving, how people approach to problem solving, how they generated ideas how they brought things to closure is a very robust conversation, especially in the context that the members of the class actually get real time feedback because they learn about their preferred problem solving style as a result of this inventory. Now, all of this is benign, but it sure does stimulate a conversation. And, you know, one of the, one of the favorite, my favorite byproducts of this is, you know, you, you ask the question, have you ever gone into a meeting and you got one person that wants to fill up every every writing surface in the room with ideas and yet really doesn't want to get any of them done and walks out of the meeting in a half an hour, leaving people to clean up after it. And everybody laughs because we all know who that person is. And then we talk about, well, how does their brain operate and how do they approach problems and are they valuable? Um, And one of my favorite quotations illustrating this is from Franklin Roosevelt describing Winston Churchill. And Roosevelt said, Winston's got 100 new ideas every day, two of which are usable. And, uh, and so then as we start to talk about that particular cognitive style, people can, it kind of lifts off the page immediately. And more often than not, I, w- I watch my colleagues say, now I understand, because I understand why I'm this way based upon this very benign inventory. But I also understand the contrast between how I approach it, and I'm trying as hard as I can and how they approach it, and they're trying as hard as they can, but we've been just rubbing each other's fur backwards all this time, not figuring that not figuring that we could work together because we're so different. And now I realize that we need to be interdependent and work together. So those are some kind of pragmatic things that are, you know, this this isn't this isn't uh, rocket science as the saying goes. Either. It's good. It's kind of practical, common sense writ large, but done so in such a systematic way that people can actually use it. And that's kind of a promise that, that I've always adhered to. And that is, if you can't use what we're talking about in the seminar, we're really not doing, doing our job or are really helping you. Can you give me an example that comes to mind of a person or an organization you're working with where there was a breakdown in leadership and talk about how that affected leadership? What was that exact scenario to help these things become real for us? Yeah, well, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, the breakdown that I've encountered uh, oftentimes, and I think as we reflect back to well, what is it, you know, seven or eight years ago now, uh, when the when the profession was in turmoil because of the 
um, you know, the marketplace changing as rapidly as it could. And the uh, construction, construction industry, of course, lagging architecture, but, you know, the layoffs and the fragmentation that was being felt in the, in the profession itself was this. And again, this wasn't a, an egregious error on the part of leaders, but it was problematic because what occurred was a discontinuity. That's kind of the simplest way of describing it. All of a sudden, we were going along thinking that it was, would be business as usual, and we would just iterate those practices which had worked for us in the past, and then everything changed. It was this massive pivot. Uh, that particular phenomenon has been referred to as a black swan. <clears throat> May I digress? Everybody knows that swans are white. You know, common knowledge is that swans are white until you see a black swan, and you have to change all of your assumptions about how the world operates in that particular domain. Well, it's used as a construct because in the, in the world that we live in with technology driving things and with, you know, organizations having to think about different structures and the challenges that the built environment is creating for us, oftentimes you'll find yourself in a situation where um, something happens and you didn't realize it was going to happen or you, know, you didn't expect it and now you're caught flat-footed. Now, truth be told, if we had been paying attention, we might have seen it coming. That's a different conversation. But what I saw happen with senior leaders and organizations was that, you know, they got to this discontinuity. They didn't know how to embrace the complexity of what they were dealing with. And then they pulled back. You know, they, they pulled they pulled back. They reorganized at a lower level of functionality. And they, what by simplifying their organization, figured they'd just be able to kind of to, uh, uh, to revive themselves and then return to business as practice uh, in the past. And I, I found that to be a fairly significant problem. And so the, the, the issue for the leader is this, and that is, you know, if, if everything is predictable and you can see things clearly and there aren't a lot of moving parts and you pretty much have everything in control, that's actually where you manage an organization. But when there are huge discontinuities, the change is very rapid, or you're encountering situations that you've never seen before, you know, somebody's got to wade in there. And that's where the leader becomes a critically important person in terms of kind of guiding the group uh, forward, if you will. But, you know, the daunting and somewhat unsettling thing, therefore, about that is, is that you find yourself in a situation, if you're the primary person in this particular thing, um, saying to yourself, I don't have a clue as to what's going on here. But having the confidence uh, to be able to say that to themselves and to others, because the next statement at the after I don't have a clue is, but don't worry, we'll figure it out. And so one of the things that we like to talk about at, at all levels in the organization is that once you hit one of these discontinuities and you encounter something that you weren't prepared for or never expected it was going to occur, the, re the, the reflex necessary to be successful is to, is to face it and get a hold of it and move forward toward it. Because once you, you know, once you encounter that and move past it, uh, what seemed to be daunting at the time, once a person is able to master the circumstance, or at least if nothing more to deal with it effectively, is then it becomes uh, past practice. And then people can turn around and continue to move forward. So the, the real critical issue for for me was, did you pull back, which means you, perhaps you survive, but you'll never thrive in the future because your natural reflex is to pull back, or did you turn and embrace the full complexity of the situation and try to build the capacity, your own capacity and that of others to deal with complexity going forward? Can you tell me a specific story where you've seen these leadership principles really played out, either in a positive or a negative way? Well, you know, you're now now you've opened the door for me in it because I'm a I'm a, a storyteller, if I may. And if you don't mind, I'll use an example from uh, from an organization that uh, that I worked in and that I had great admiration for 25 years ago, and that that was Hewlett Packard Company, and um, that was a one of the best led companies in America. Uh, from the six, you know, from when they started the company in the early 1950s up to and including, uh, the, I would say, the middle 1980s, largely as a result of the influence of Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett. 
because they had this uncanny ability to, to listen and to observe and to make sense out of things. And so this was part of the folklore of HP, if I may digress. And again, we're beaming back now to the last century. Um, but uh, the company was reasonably successful in the 1950s and 60s, and they were starting to get larger orders from government contracts. And they found themselves in situations where, because of the cyclical nature of government contracts, you know, they'd be, uh, be feast or famine at times. But Packard's value system, and of course he and Hewlett were strong collaborators and, and truthfully both agreed to this, but their value system was, we're not going to lay anybody off. Uh, this is a fairly provocative statement because of kind of general and conventional wisdom about how you deal with people. But in fact, they made the commitment to folks and they said, you come and join us and we're going to make sure you have decent work to do, but we're not going to lay you off if you don't. And so the event occurred where all of a sudden the business dropped out from underneath them and they found themselves with about 10% too many folks. And so, so the finance folks went to the leadership and they said, you know, we think we're going to have to lay off about 10% of our population here. And the response from the leaders was, we're not going to do that. We promised people that they were going to have, uh, you know, a viable uh, job and a commitment from us going forward, figure out a way around this problem. And so, you know, people were in a muddle because all conventional wisdom was, well, you just lay them off and you'll hire it back. But HP didn't do that. As a matter of fact, one of the more clever folks came back and, and said to them, well, we think if everyone takes a 10% pay cut, that will be sufficient to, to weather the storm here for a short period of time. Uh, and that would be everybody. That'd be, you know, you guys all the way down to the person doing the direct labor work in the factory. And they said, okay, that sounds okay, but let's, let's do it this way. And they said, let's ensure that uh, people know that it's not a pay cut, but they can take a day off without pay every two weeks. And that became known as the Fortnite program. Now, you can probably see why I'm telling you this story, because that was an, an event that occurred back in the 1960s that actually set the tone for many high-tech companies in, in California in terms of how they dealt with human resources. Well, that, that particular behavior was really kind of interesting, and there were some unintended consequences, one of which was that people, even though they didn't have actual work that they needed to do, came to work the 10th day every two weeks. And what did they do? Well, they cleaned the place and they painted things and they did other things that would otherwise have been considered housekeeping. And then they did something provocative as well. They started learning new skills on the job, if you will, because they were getting paid. And it developed this viability within the organization where they were constantly looking for the implications of new developments going forward as partners in the process here because it wasn't just a certain segment that was cut out of the workforce. It was everybody that was, you know, essentially embracing the problem going forward. And so what happened was, well, the, the business came back around again. The company that laid people off, of course, got back on their feet. But because Hewlett and Packard had a fully developed workforce that had been actively engaged in a number of different processes, not the least of which was fortifying the culture of the organization, not only were, were, was everyone able to go back to work without any, uh, without any hiccups, but their commitment to the success of the organization was profound. And I think, truthfully, that's one of those moments when HP actually hit the afterburners and became a, a you know, technology leader, uh, but also a very compassionate and uh, thoughtful employer. And again, I think it really set the tone in Silicon Valley for so many companies. Now, the rest of the story, of course, is for another conversation, but that was an event that it took a tremendous amount of risk because they could have driven the company into the tank and they chose not to do so. Uh, Pete, are there any questions that, or maybe just one question that I should have asked you that I haven't? Yeah, I actually, you know, if, if you don't mind, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple things. First of all is, um, I'd ask, I'd advocate that you open the conversation that my friends, um, Aaron Carter and Ryan Smith opened at the University of Utah when they started this this uh, this endeavor, which actually led to this this lovely book that they allowed me to contribute to. But one of the questions is, what's the what's the role of the university in terms of creating and sustaining some of these ideas in the developmental process? In, you know, this this very robust program that architects go through, not only undergraduate but in many cases now graduate school. 
what, what role should we expect from the academy in assisting that process? That, that would be one thing. And then, and then the other uh, thing that I'd ask that you consider and advocate for is um, how do we actually embrace the idea of citizen architect? You know, is that something that the profession, um, which is now having conversations about, can actually uh, move toward a more clearer articulation of what that actually means for architects, you know, throughout the professional spectrum? Have you had thoughts about or conversations about those things? They've come up every now and then in some interviews. What are your thoughts on becoming a citizen architect? What's entailed in that and what should we be thinking about? Well, you know, it, it, it does start with if the early preparation because I think young architects know that they're not entering the profession because you're going to, to uh, make the money that investment bankers do. So there's a, from the start, there's a, there's a passion and a love for the idea of the built environment. And so that, that really is, you know, the, the foundation of this whole thing. And so I think that, um, I think that the conversations with young architects, both in school and also in their early stages of development about how they can, in some uh, small way, but growing with influence a larger way, actually embrace some of these responsibilities. You know, how, how can they help out? Because they do have this capacity for seeing the larger problem. And then I, I, truth, I truthfully think the other part of this is that, that albeit a very small profession by way of comparison to other professions like the law or medicine, I think architects actually need to step into the, into the uh, arena, if you will, you know, into, in, not into necessarily into the fray, but at least into the conversation. I, I think, I think there's one architect uh, who's in public office at this point in time. Forgive me for not knowing that I should have done my homework. But I, I sure would love to see um, senior architects, you know, pr uh, senior principals and fellows uh, stepping beyond um, maybe the status of retired or emeriti and actually, you know, moving into the community and bringing their influence to bear. I would think those are two things that might be considered. Fantastic. Peter, it's been a fantastic conversation. Is there, are there any parting thoughts you'd like to leave with us before we call it a interview? <laughs> thanks, Enoch. I guess first and foremost, it's, it's a pleasure to talk with you. And, and thanks for the opportunity. The, the second thing was, please give, give voice to this. Uh, you know, looking at your enterprise and the, the climate for dialogue that you've created uh, with, uh, with the various endeavors you're involved in, I think is critically important. And in fact, is a significant leadership role as well. So I encourage you to keep, keep, keep the process ongoing and then maybe at, at a future date, we can start to take a look at kind of the comprehensive nature of uh, development of architects from, you know, from the first time they're in studio up to and including when they've done their, their masterpiece project. So I'd just like to keep the conversation alive at some point if we can. That sounds fantastic. Well, thank you. Dr. Peter Delisle, Honorary AIA, we appreciate having you here on the Business of Architecture. It's a great pleasure. Thank you, Ian. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. That is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.